Hello and welcome to Hexed Encountered. My name is Joe. Today I am going to be doing a some play examples. Um, not a playthrough, but some play examples. Uh, mostly stuff from the actual rule book to kind of illustrate, you know, some of the mechanisms of the game rather than doing a full playthrough only because, you know, from a time standpoint, I think. I know from, uh, you know, I can obviously look at the metrics on YouTube and I see, you know, what people watch, how long they watch, etc., etc. And I think that maybe this would be a little bit more effective than doing a, a playthrough. Um, but at least I'm going to try out that theory here with this with this game, which is a very good game. It is a new system. I did a first look on this uh, that I would definitely suggest that you check that out first if you have not seen it. The game here, as you probably already know, is by Iron and Blood. This is from White Dog Games. It is a 2023 release, so it is relatively new. It's been out a few months. It is designed by Herman Lutman, and uh, the developer was um, Fred Manzo. This is the 1866 Battle of Königgrätz between the Austrians and the Prussians. So this was basically kind of the battle that ended the Austro-Prussian War in a victory for Prussia and put them on the path to actually being the predominant power in what would become the German Empire. And uh, obviously they would go to war with France just a few years later in the Franco-Prussian War, which would kind of be the final step into the formation of the aforementioned German Reich that uh, lasted through the end of the First World War. Um, this game is uh, interesting. It uses a mechanism called the Rivers that um, Herman kind of pulled from, uh, I believe, a Batman game, which is kind of an interesting concept if you think about it. But, um, you know, whatever works, works. And this certainly works, I would say. So um, it's a little different from, you know, what uh, some of the other stuff he's done in, let's say, you know, the... Um, the blind swords games where you know you had chit pull activation and this one the mechanism is based on basically a command uh, command points and a track and the headquarters kind of move down the track and you have rules where you can spend points to select which headquarters you're going to activate obviously you have a limited number of command points per turn and once you use up all your points the turn ends well, once both sides, I should say, use up all their points to turn ends. There are also event cards that both sides can play that impact play. And this is, um, all of this works together really, really well. And I know both uh, Herman and Fred are hoping that this can become a series. And I will join them in that hope because I think this is a really interesting and innovative uh, mechanism that that they've got going on here. And I really hope to see this expand and not only because we're looking at a you know something that was a pivot pivotal battle in terms of european and world history um that has been kind of overlooked at least here in the here in the u.s i think not a lot of people really know about this aside from you know maybe at a you know high level just kind of are familiar with the fact that there was a war between austria and prussia which was followed by a war between prussia and France, and that led to the formation of the uh, the German Empire with the uh, the first Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, Otto von Bismarck, etc., etc. We're all involved in that, obviously. Uh, von Moltke, which is another famous um, Prussian and German military name. He was kind of the head of the, I think he was the chief of staff of the Prussian army at this point, kind of the overall commander. Not specifically in this battle, but just in general. Anyway, enough background information. I'd like to kind of go through some of the examples of how things work so that you can see them here on the board. What you see here laid out is the actual initial deployment for the battle. So this is game turn number one. You can see the game turn track over here. So it is 8 a.m. The date is July 3rd, 1866. So we're actually coming up on the anniversary of that date. Here, as I do this in uh, late June of 2023. And you have the entire map here. It's visible. Um, 
You know, the map is not large. This is a canvas map. I like it a lot. I really like canvas maps. Um, as I mentioned, this is White Dog Games. The, um, the printer for these is Blue Panther. I really like Blue Panther stuff. Um, the counters are nice. They do offer the, the canvas, uh, canvas map, which is, which is, I, I think really nice. Um, it's laid out. It's very, it's very nice and smooth. There's a crease in the middle kind of a little bit, but in general, really like this. So here's our victory point track. Both sides have victory point markers. This would be Prussia. It's got one here, and then there's one for Austria. We also have for both sides, a 10 and a 100, as you can see right here. Uh, both Prussia and Austria have those. Here we have our Austrian cards, our Prussian cards. The Prussians have two decks because a key component of this battle was the arrival of the second army. The Prussian second army coming on kind of tilted the, um, tilted the scales in favor of Prussia. Prussia was heavily outnumbered in this battle, at least, you know, initially and actually through the whole thing, but especially at the beginning. So let's talk about the command track, which is at the center of this, right? You have this, ta this track where you have command points that determine how, you know, basically you have currency in terms of command points that you spend to activate your unit. So let's look at how that looks. Okay, so here you have the Austrian command point cost, um, command point track and the Prussian command point track. Now, they're basically identical. Both sides at the initial part of the game, in the initial portion of the game until the second army arrives, get eight points per turn. Now, it is possible to have points left over at the end of your turn that will get carried over. This is somewhat unlikely because chances are you're going to want to use those to do something, okay? So you can, in theory, carry some over, but typically that's not going to be the case. So you have your eight. Now, up here on both sides, you see that you've got basically a number of points per box, and that's the activation cost. So you have one, two, and then two again, then two of three each, and then a four, and then spent. So basically what happens is you have, you will select from your pile of headquarter counters, which are these guys right here, you'll put them in these boxes, and that will allow you to uh, basically determine kind of the priority of who you want to activate. So the guys who are cheapest would be the ones that you would want to activate first because at certain points during the, during the turn, the, the, the river mechanic takes over and they slide to the left. So you're, you'll have gaps that will then get, you know, filled as stuff moves from this spent box into your four, four CP box and then down. So you could, in theory, you could activate the same unit more than once in a turn, but it's going to cost extra CP to do so. Um, so you have the ability, and this is where it really plays in great with strategy. You have the ability to kind of determine and weigh the, the benefit of actually being able to use that unit now and paying more in terms of command points or trying to do something else and waiting for them to get a little bit less expensive down the road and then you can pull them and activate them. And this is a two player game. You can play it solitaire, but it's really designed for two players. But if you are playing two players, you can take some of your, some of your units. So here we have the second core of the Austrian North army. Okay. So let's say we want this guy to be the first army that we're going to activate. We can take them and we can turn them over and you can see on the back, it just says, it just has the Austrian Eagle and says activation, right? So you can put this here. Now your opponent doesn't know what that is. Now in the rule book, it is pointed out that you could, if you wanted to play it, you know, face up so that you have full information on both sides, which obviously will impact on how the strategy works between the two players, because the one player is, both players will know, you know, Who's, who are the inexpensive ones that can be activated for less cost and are therefore more likely to be activated, if not in the next, you know, ex next activation for your opponent, then probably very soon thereafter. Okay, so I kind of laid these out in an example. Now, this isn't necessarily, you know, the ideal for start or whatever, but it should be a reasonable facsimile thereof. 
So here on the Austrian side, we have the third core and they're color coded on the map. And I'll show you the map again here in a second. They're the third core, the Saxon core, the 10th core, fourth core, second core, eighth core, and underneath that, the reserve. Okay. Now you notice that there's this North Army headquarter here of General Benedek, and this one lets you do some special stuff. So we'll talk about that here in a second. On the Prussian side, we have the Elba Army, 4th Corps, 2nd Corps, 3rd Corps, and the 1st Reserve Corps, and then our 1st Army HQ, Prince Friedrich Karl. He's sitting with the 4th Corps. Okay, so now what happens with these army headquarters, right? Because you have 1st Army Headquarter, North Army Headquarter. Now, the Prussians also have a stack for the 2nd Army for when that arrives. So here's our 2nd Army Headquarters under Crown Prince Friedrich. So the way the Army Headquarters works is here we have North Army HQ General Benedek, okay? They can activate anyone from their uh, army. Now, on the Austrian side, not an issue. North Army HQ commands everybody. Everyone's under General Benedek on the Austrian side. On the Prussian side, we have 1st Army HQ, and currently, at game start, all of these units are under 1st Army, and it tells you that right on the counter, right? So you see North Army over here for everybody and 1st Army over here for everybody. When the 2nd Army comes in, that's when you might have, on the Prussian side, you do get two additional CP, so they will they'll gain 10 every turn, but they'll also have to you have to kind of manage your HQ a little bit more carefully because you can only activate with your HQ a unit from the same army. So if we had the second army HQ in here somewhere and it was, you know, sitting next to a first army unit, it couldn't activate it because that's how the eight army HQs work. They can activate a, a unit on either side of them or the one that's stacked with them. And when you do that, the army HQ goes to the spent box. Normally, if you just activate a unit on its own, so if we activated 3rd Corps without using the Army HQ, 3rd Corps would go to the spent box. Uh, so if you play your quote-unquote cards right, and it's not cards, it's counters in this case, you would be able to activate, say, 3rd Corps twice. Because you can, uh, you can say, okay, I'm going to activate it using my North, Arm North Army HQ activates 3rd Corps. A Army HQ goes to the spent box. Third Corps stays where it is. Third Corps then down on the map can do something. That's its activation, and then it can get activated again. So you can activate the same unit back to back, essentially, if you want to. All for the cost, cost of moving your Army HQ back. So the Army HQs are important because they basically, if you place them right, they've got three things, three different units they can activate that is kind of almost like a free activation. Same thing on the Prussian side. You know, 1st Army HQ says, I'm going to activate 4th Corps. Then the Army HQ goes in here. 4th four, fourth Corps, rather, can do its thing for 2 CP because it's in a 2 CP box. And then it could go again also in the 2 CP box. And then it would go to the spent box. And that opens up a spot. And that's when everybody would flow down once we get to the uh, reset step. So that's kind of how that part of it works. So here we're looking at our sequence of play. So you have move game turn marker, pretty straightforward, it's over here. Determine player command C CP. So the, as, as I mentioned, you get eight per turn. The Prussians will get 10 when the second army HQ arrives. And we'll talk about the uh, second army arrival and all that stuff here in a little bit. You draw your event cards, Prussians get three, Austrians get two, okay? Then you do the initiative determination. And here's another place where CP becomes important because you can use your CP to gain an initiate to gain a plus two on your die roll. So both team both teams, <laughs> both sides will roll a die and high, high die wins. Um, if it's a tie, you see lull on the battlefield, you take three CP from both sides and re-roll. If you dub if you roll doubles. Um, or double high roll. That means, say, player uh, the the Prussians roll a six, the Austrians roll a three. They they get dot what's called dominant initiative, and dominant initiative really just means that they um, get to go back to back. Next, we go to the activation phase. So the player with initiative, it's, if you're starting the turn, will obviously go first. 
then it'll alternate after that with either an activation or a pass. So um, you don't have to activate somebody. You can pass, okay? Just keep that in mind. And then you have your formation activation step, and then you go through basically what happens in that activation. These are the things the unit can do. They can do a fire, a movement, an assault, and then you get to the rally and reset step. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward, and this kind of follows sort of um, some of the things you might be familiar from some of uh, Herman Lutman's other games. And then you get to the end of the turn, and you check your second army arrival by drawing one of the second army arrival cards. And then you do your victory points to determine, you know, who's holding victory points. Um, again, you see the, the colored, and I say again because I mentioned this in the first look video. You see the colors here. They indicate uh, victory point locations. And depending on the color, yellow, yellow is a victory point every turn. And green is a vic or I'm sorry, a victory point only for the victory point for both sides. And green is victory points only for the Prussians. And they get uh, five victory points actually for holding these per turn. And whoever holds the yellow ones gets one victory point per turn. That's why you can, and we do have a counter for victory points times 100, because they can actually get to 100. So let's look at a couple of examples here of, you know, the various steps, movement, fire, combat, etc., assault, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Talk about that stuff, and then um, I'll wrap it up, give you a few final thoughts, and uh, that'll do it. So the first thing that has to be done when you activate a unit is to give it orders. And here we have our Austrian command player aid. So let's assume the Austrians have initiative. So they're going to give, they're going to activate somebody. And let's say they activate their uh, third core. Okay. They're going to give it orders. So you have these to choose from. You have March. Okay. Which gives them a plus one to their move allowance and and they get the road bonus. Units may not move adjacent to enemy units, and they cannot conduct any combat. Pretty straightforward. Engage order gives them their normal movement allowance, and they may issue fire combat, but may not assault. So they can basically move and shoot at somebody, but they can't assault them. And you have assault where they lose one movement allowance, and they may conduct fire combat, but that may not then make an assault move. But eligible units may assault move and assault combat. So if you're close enough to where you can get there with your minus one MA to actually get in and assault somebody, then you can do that via an assault move. Regroup is a minimum move, but may not be adjacent to, to an enemy. So you can move, but not, not, into a, not adjacent to an enemy. Pretty straightforward, right? May not fire or assault combat. Eligible units may rally. So basically you have somebody who's you know, shaken or disrupted, and you want to rally them, you give them a regroup order, and as long as they're not, you know, around an enemy unit, they can actually move a little bit and then try a rally action. Then we have our movement. So you can see movement allowances. All the units have different movement allowances, and there is not a movement factor on the counter, so you kind of need to uh, basically... I, memorize this but it's not it's really not that complicated and you can always glance here if you if you wish to so you have your austrian kind of ag infantry saxon infantry and saxon artillery get three austrian inf regular infantry and artillery get two austrian and saxon light cavalry get seven austrian and saxon cavalry normal cavalry i guess heavy essentially six minimum move means they can move one legal hex so they can't move into a and into a hex that's not legal for movement, of course. And then units that used artillery um, strength point, which means they fired using their artillery strength point or strength points, however that may be. And, and another thing to remember is all of the units uh, have in some inherent artillery. So that's why it says that, because they, they may attack and use that as opposed to using their regular firepower. They can't move. Then your movement costs for your terrain, uh, clear town, woods, etc. Um, it says both types. There's only one light woods on the map. Everything else, uh, that's this guy right here, the Holovald. Uh, it's like Sveepvald here is, is heavy woods. 
everything else is basically heavy woods except for Holovald. Uh, so, and then you crossing the Elba, crossing the Bistritz, the ne Nekonitz Bridge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's this guy over here. And it's red for your viewing pleasure so that you know that that is the, the special bridge that you have to do this die roll. And um, if you don't cross it, the bridge is blo blocked for the rest of the activation. So uh, when you activate a formation, you activate all the units of that color. So if we activated our third core here from the North Army for one CP, we can move this guy or we can act. The units that are activated would be our AG infantry here. And then we got an artillery here and we got infantry and infantry. So these can all be activated or are activated rather and all can all do some action, but you have to give them orders. The game does use line of sight rules. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, basically they're very, they're very logical. Let's put it that way. It's, uh, you know, things are kind of obvious, you know, blocking is basically es essentially you know, doing, uh, looking at elevation levels. Obviously, you can't see through an elevation level that's higher than where you are and things like that. Um, very straightforward. I really won't go into it because it's very, like I said, it's straightforward and it's pretty much the same as in many other games, including many of uh, Herman Luttman's other games, whether it's Blind Swords or whatever. They're, the The line of sight stuff is pretty similar to that. So I won't really go into that, and we're just going to talk about kind of how fire combat works. Okay, so here's an example of fire combat. So we have our 5-3 Prussian infantry here, okay, and it's going, it's announced that he's going to fire at our PRI unit here, which is shaken, okay, and it's in the town of Setovis, right? So they're adjacent to each other, so the unit can, can choose to use its uh, full regular firepower, in this case that's an 11, or it's artillery SP, which is a 6. So our player announces he's going to use his full full regular firepower of 11. I say firepower, it's actually strength points. So he's going to use his 11 infantry strength points as opposed to his 6 artillery strength points to fire at our already shaken uh, Austrian infantry here. Because this would allow him to then move this unit. Because remember, if you use your artillery uh, SP, you can't move the unit. So since if you want to move, you need to use your uh, infantry SP. So they're going to move and then they would have the ability, or fire rather, and then they would have the ability to move. So you look at your Prussian fire combat result table. So here it is. Okay, so we're going to start in the 10-11 column here, right? And then we adjust for the various uh, conditions that are based down in here for column shifts. He checks the list of column shifts and sees the following apply in this case. Firing unit on higher elevation because they're in a forest hex that's actually higher. So they get a shift of one to the right, which moves them into this column, the 12-14 column. Firing unit has a higher TE rating because the Prussian unit is a 5 and the Austrian is a 3 because of being shaken. Okay, so he's in here and then he gets a shift to the left for being the tar target unit being in a town is a shift to the left. So we have the higher elevation and we have the higher TE, both shift one to the right. The town shifts it one to the left, so we end up in the 12-14. He rolls his dice and he gets a five and a six. So you use two different color dice. Like here I have white and white, red, <laughs> white and white, red and white. So in the book, it talks about black and white. So if you have black and white, use black and white, but I'm going to, I have red and white. So if we had say, um, actually that's backwards, but if you had a five and a six, you come here to the 54 to 56, come all the way across to 1214, you get a DS. And a DS is a disruption. And because the unit's already uh, shaken, it flips to the disrupted side and retreats two hexes. So it gets flipped to disrupted and has to retreat two hexes. So it can go 
you know, one, two, and being hellevolved there like so. And that is your example. Um, well, let's say move to 1208, which would be here. So it could move here as well. So in the example, the Austrian player moves to 1208. And that's how that works. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, now let's talk about assault combat and how that works. So, okay, so here we have the town of Nakanitz, and here's that pesky bridge. You can kind of see it. It's a little bit hidden there by our shaken marker. But this is the red bridge, okay? And this is the Bistrich River, and the only way to cross it is at this bridge, at least at this point. There's another crossing further north. But for the sake of this example, we're going to say that this, uh, Aust um, I'm sorry, this Prussian artillery fired using its artillery rating here, it's artillery SP, fired at this guy and, and got a shaken result. So our um, Saxon unit here is now shaken and it's sitting in the town, okay? Our 14 uh, Elba unit here is going to attack this unit via assault. So it, can, it didn't fire, therefore it is eligible to do assault movement, which will get it here, okay? So first thing it would do is move to the bridge and then he has to roll to cross this bridge because this is the special bridge and you have to roll to get across it. So you can only move across when, with a three to six die roll. You can always retreat across this bridge for free, but to get across it uh, voluntarily, so to speak, you have to roll for it and a three to six is good. So let's assume he rolls a five. So now he has successfully crossed the bridge and because he rolled a five, which is the same as his uh, TE number up here, that gives him the, the possibility to make it a breakthrough, which would allow him to move on and do something else after. So we'll put a breakthrough on the, on the hex so that we know this is a reminder that he can use breakthrough movement, assuming he wins the assault. Okay, so he's successfully moved through and he's on top now because he's in the same hex. Okay, so his SP here is an 11, and the SP of the defender is a 5, okay? But defenders get to use their artillery and infantry SP points, so he's actually a 7. So it's 11 to 7, okay? That's a key point that needs to be remembered, is that the attacker can only use their infantry SP, but the defender in an assault can always use their infantry plus artillery SP. Okay, so just like with the fire combat, you have an assault combat table. And this is basically your differential. Attacking unit SP less defending unit SP. So it's 11-7, which puts us in this column right here. Okay, now you get the, um, basically the red indicates who wins the fight. And then you also have the result of what happens to them from, you know, shaken to disrupted etc etc and then at the very bottom here the br is broken okay but you also have column shifts just like we did on the regular fire combat table so you have to look at all of these stuff and you can have cavalry which has a, a special kind of assault of its own but essentially what we do here is we get a one to the left for the prussians crossing the bridge hex side Okay, so they had to cross, they had to cross water, basically, right? Uphill stream bridge, one column shift to the left. Another one for the defender being in a town hex. Okay, so here's a town. We get another one to the left. So that's two to the left now. So we go from here over to the to basically the even. The minus one to plus one, basically even. You get a one to the right because the because the Prussian unit has a TE rating one higher than the defender. So he has a higher, uh, I'm sorry, attacker has a, has a higher. That's one per, okay? So he gets a one to the right because his TE is one higher than, than the defender. So they're both five, but because... The Saxon unit, I know it's small here, but because the Saxon unit is shaken, it gets a minus one. So that five, this five here becomes a four. Okay, so it's five, four, so that gives them a shift to the one 
uh, to the right by one. And the defender could elect to spend a CP, but the attacker does decide to spend a CP to help the crossing, and that moves them to a... Um, see, attacking unit spends one CP, gets two shifts to the right. If the defender does it, they get two shifts to the left. That's going to move him. So we went from, from here, we went over here, then over here, then back here. And then we would get two more shifts to the right. So the co final column is actually going to end up being our plus seven to nine column here. Because we started here and we ended up with a net of plus one. Because we had minus two and then a plus three. So we ended up as a plus one right here. Then we roll our dice. And our roll is a 42. And we look here, 42 under seven, nine. 42.79 is attacker shaken, defender shaken. And so the, the 14 elbow unit wins the combat while getting a shaken marker. The Lieb Saxon unit as the loser must retreat one hex and it gets a shaken result. Since it's already shaken, it has to re retreat an additional hex. And because of the breakthrough marker, a third hex. So basically what happens is this guy here has to retreat three hexes. So he could go, let's just say he goes one, two, three, and he stays shaken. Now our attacker is also shaken, so he'll get a shaken marker as well. And because of the breakthrough, he can actually move one hex close. He can advance another hex. So... That way, you end up with a situation somewhat like that. So that's how assault works. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, reset step. So let's say we're in the middle of a turn and we get to the reset step. And the thing we're going to do here is basically do our river stuff, right? So let's say that our Prussian player, and this is first army and second army, as you can see. The guard core has just been activated. It's going into the spent box. Okay, so that's now in the spent box because it was just activated. Now that obviously opens up a hole here. Okay, so you move the third core here. You move your first army HQ and the first reserve core moves up. The Elba army moves up. And now you have your second uh, three CP box. And you can choose somebody from your 4CP that's not in the spent box to move up. So you have all of those that you can choose from. And let's just say we take the uh, second core here and we just drop that guy in there. Okay. So you can move one basically. And that's how the reset step works. And this guy, after being in the spent box, at the end of the reset step, goes into the 4CP box. So that's basically how that works. Now, you can activate these units, but you have to pay 4CP to do it, which is obviously pretty expensive when you get, at most, if you're the Prussians, you get 10. If you're the Austrians, you get 8 CP per turn. So that is how the reset step works. And now I'm going to show you how you handle the second army arrival with with the card play and the and how you can use event cards as the Austrian player to kind of impact what the Prussian player is doing as far as getting the second army in. Okay, so let's look at the uh, Prussian second army arrival. Okay, so this is basically at the end of the turn, and. So it happens after all the activations are done and everything, and you're ready to move on to the next turn. The Prussian will draw a card from the, Pru the Prussian second army arrival deck and discard them. And then they, they all have numbers on the back, which will indicate uh, how many, basically how many points or activation points, the AN arrival numbers, that they can use to bring their units onto uh, the board. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that here in a second, but let's just say, okay, he's ready to draw his card and he's drawing his card. And then the Austrian says, Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to play my, one of my event cards here. And it's going to be 
the Finkenstein delayed Second Army Staff Problems card. And you can see here it says, play during the Second Army Arrival step after the Prussian player draws a card. Look at that drawn card and you may force the Prussian player to draw a new card to replace it. The Prussian player must draw a new card and then an originally drawn card is shuffled back into the draw pile. Okay, so he plays this card. Looks, oh, it's a three. So I'm going to make you you know, not use this and it's going to get shuffled back into the deck. So I'm just going to stick it on the bottom here for example, just for example purposes. Okay, so now my Prussian player says, all right, I have to draw another card. Oh, look, it's a three again. So now we have a total of six here because we have a one and a two and a three. Now you have this on the Prussian command player aid down here at the bottom, you can see we have the Prussian Second Army Arrival Schedule and how many AN points you need to bring them in. Now, since we have six, that enables us to bring in the first AG guard uh, formation. Well, it's a, it's a unit from the guard formation. So you can bring in the guard core formation activation marker plus this unit and you can put them in 1301, 1401, or 1501. And then as you go on, you can bring in more and more until you get, uh, you know. And obviously when you, get, when you get to the next one, you can bring in your second army, HQ, which then gives the Prussian player 10 command points per turn and allows them to do even more activations. So, you know, this is kind of like, uh, almost like an avalanche that's coming to, you know, kind of bury, bury the Austrians. So it's important that, um, you know, event cards are played right. And as the, as the Prussian player, because if you look in here, there's threes, there's zeros, you know, so, and there's the big, the big kahuna, the four here, but you have uh, three, zero, one, two, two, four. So, um, you're going to get your, you're going to get them on the board eventually, but it could take a little while. And, um, so that is how that part works. And then of course, as I mentioned, there are victory points, um, which you would do, do next. You basically look at the map, any yellow victory point locations that are currently or previously occupied by, um, one side or the other ga gains one point for that side for that turn. And then the green ones are for the Prussians only, and they're worth five. So all the green victory point locations are on the uh, the eastern side of the map or the right side as you're looking at it. So basically, since the Prussians start in the northwest corner, they need to move south and uh, east to basically capture all of those. But they and along the way they need to knock the Austrians out of those yellow ones because every time the Austrians are sitting in those, every turn they sit in those, they get another victory point. So that is how it works. And at the end of the game, once you've gone through all turn ten, I'm sorry, twelve turns, uh, whoever has the most victory points wins. Uh, you also have the two, uh, basically the two cities in the corners. Koeniggrätz in the southeastern corner is a instant victory for the Prussians if they get there. And Milovitz in the uh, northwest corner of the map would likewise be an instant victory for the Austrians if they can get there. So that's how that works. So this has been a kind of playthrough of the game by Iron and Blood, again from White Dog Games. Designed by Herman Lutman, uh, developed by Fred Manzo, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of quickly to recap, uh, I, I, I think this system is really well done. Um, I'm not really surprised by that, to be honest, uh, given, given the team that worked on it. And uh, so, yeah, I think this is a really good, solid game. Lots of strategy possibilities using the command points and, you know, how you activate, how and when you activate your units, obviously coupled with what orders you give them, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of tactical strategy that, that goes in there with, you know, doing it the right way and, and so on and so forth. Playing your event cards. I didn't really talk a lot about the event cards, but both sides have event cards they can use to do certain things that will obviously help them. So that plays into it as well. The, um, 
The depth of strategy available to both players in this game is outstanding. And I really do hope that this game does well enough that they will, that, um, you know, Herman and Fred will, will continue the series and do some more, do some more games here because the, this is, in my opinion, fantastic. I highly recommend it. So if you are looking for a nice, uh, step back into the 19th century and, a, you know, an important but uh, less known battle. This one is a great one to uh, to kind of dip your toes in and, and into this new system. So that will do it. Um, I appreciate you guys watching. As always, please feel free to comment. Let me know your thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I hope you found this uh, useful slash enjoyable. Maybe both. That would be awesome. Uh, but that's going to do it. So my name's Joe. This, as always, is Hexed Encountered. And until next time, happy gaming.